Ladies and gentlemen, you know that traditions are here to stay, and that's exactly what we also will do with the final session of this year's conference. To resume all what we learned today and discuss also how the trends in post-COVID fleet management, sustainability, corporate mobility, and technology will build our future, who better to invite than three CEOs of the biggest leasing companies in Europe. So it's my pleasure to welcome on stage Mr. Marco Lessacher, the CEO of Alphabet International. Marco, it's great to see you again. Good to see you. Thanks for the invitation. How are you doing? Great. Okay, Thanks for the perfect. Take a seat. You can sit wherever you want. My second guest is the CEO of Arval, and that's Alain van Groenendaal. Alain, he's playing a home game as he is originally from Belgium. <laughs> and my third guest is Tim Albertson, the CEO of ALD Automotive. Tim, welcome in Brussels. Thank you. Take a seat. I'm going to put my chair a little bit like this. So, I'm going to explain you something because I know that you arrived not this morning, so probably you did not see the first sessions, I can imagine. For each of the five panels, we uh, showed a screen with some figures or with some information. And so you see on the screen a ranking of countries. It's a coincidence that these countries are your home countries, but they mean something for the leasing industry and for the customers. We did a survey, and on one question, the answer was number one, Germany, and number two, in an equal position, Belgium and Denmark. Do you have any idea where the question could be related to? Is there anyone? Usually I would say football. <laughs> Usually I would say football, but uh, since Germany is not in good shape, uh, that can't be the answer. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and the second place for Belgium, that could be the case indeed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, it's not. So it's related to in which country do you want to change your leasing partner? Okay, so we asked the global fleet community. Now the good news is that more than half has also indicated that, are, that they are not wanting to change their leasing partners at the moment. So congratulations already on that. Um, just as an introduction. Well, that gives me something to think about. Eh? Okay, you, so you can uh, look I it up in the results of the Global Fleet Survey 2021. Yeah, I guess it also gives us a bit of to think about because I think we have really good market shares both in Belgium and Denmark. So, <laughs> and okay. we in Germany. Well, I, I wouldn't be uh, the German on stage. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> but Belgium is also there. <laughs> well, they are of course, also other topics. And I know, dear colleagues, friends, people here in the room, that there are some answers that you would like to have. And I have agreed to, to ask one question, and then we continue with the topics that we have decided on, and those are related to the topics of this conference. But we need to ask it, of course, Tim. You, yourself, your company, communicated last week, I think, something very interesting for the industry. Can you tell us a little bit more? Uh, unfortunately not. Uh, it's too early at this stage, but it's true that, uh, like we communicated, that there is discussions between us and lease plan. So, um, and of course, <laughs> that would be interesting news, uh, but uh, at this point, it's way too early to say where this would lead us. Okay. So that's for that. Then we will have another interesting topic to start with. Um, many fleet managers, almost all car manufacturers, and probably also you, are impacted by the current ship shortage crisis. So let's start with that one. 
And in what way, and I would like to start with Marco, in what way is that affecting your business, also knowing that your mother company, of course, is BMW Group, yes? And what advice can you give to customers to overcome the upcoming months? What is the best way to do? So thanks for the question. So first of all, I'm not here to speak for BMW, but I think whoever reads the newspapers and sees a little bit also the financial results, also for the globally common factors, obviously this seems to be a very interesting development and maybe something we could never have uh, tested in a laboratory. So that is maybe one thing when it's about the OEMs. When it's about us, um, what the effect of the chip shortage is, one thing is uh, on the RV side. Uh, definitely also the shortage is here uh, 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 in, in that arena. Also days to sell, also a huge demand, which at least gives us a little bit support also from a financial perspective. Uh, on the new business side, the problem is that uh, usually we had a turning ratio of two, two and a half months between order and uh, delivery to the customer. At the moment, we are somewhere between seven and eight months. Um, in some countries, it's uh, sometimes even not possible to order cars anymore for customers. And also discussions with our dear uh, suppliers, also internally, are quite challenging, let's uh, put it that way. And uh, to give a recommendation to, to, the, the, to the customers is, um, yeah, try to stay as flexible as possible, one thing. Second, uh, a very stupid, uh, maybe, advice, but order, all, uh, order early. So, and maybe... Also, be aware that not every extra that uh, the customer wants to have is available at the moment. So better to order a car with the one or two extras not in the car and to get a car instead of waiting and get contacted three or four times. Huh? And the last thing, as I said, is also uh, 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 maybe be a little bit more flexible with mm -hmm. rental solutions to bridge. So, and the last advice could be extend your leasing contracts. That is, might be also an interesting thing uh, from a financial perspective, because then you have at least a kind of a stability also in your calculation. Okay. Um, Alain, how long can fleet customers extend their leasing contracts? Because it started about 18 months ago with the pandemic, working from home, business is closed, and it seems to continue to continue. Uh, probably it's not possible for your customers to keep on extending those contracts. Well, I think that uh, I fully share the comment uh, made by Marco. In uh, Arval, on average basis today, uh, delivery time is about 180 days, which is more than the double what we have had in the past. So it's a lot, and it's a pity. It's a pity because the business, the volume, the commercial activity is very strong. In fact, if we look at the orders we have each and every month, and if we compare that with 2019, let's forget about 2020, the growth this year is double digit than 2019. So customers are there, companies are growing, uh, economy is picking up. Unfortunately, we don't get the cars. So the advice uh, we give to the clients is very much the same. Uh, anticipate as much as possible the order, extend the contract, and quite frankly, uh, what we see is that the mileage, on average, is lower than pre-pandemic, so there is room to further uh, extend the contract. And be flexible. Uh, take mid-term contracts, uh, take uh, uh, other models that are easily available and so forth. Mm -hmm. But it's an issue. And to be very frank, uh, I guess that issue uh, will come with a second issue that will be the price of the cars going forward. Because we all know, uh, because of raw materials, uh, shipping costs, logistics, uh, spare parts, tires, everything, there is a likelihood that the cost price will move up. And I think that the role of our industry uh, is to make sure that we do as much as we can to lower the impact of this for our clients. Mm -hmm. Could that mean that also the lease price will go up? Yeah, I think actually the, uh, there's two things in the shortage of chips, you know, because somehow... I think the manufacturers also are looking into clean up a bit the markets, and we see that they are increasing their margins. Uh, they have actually cancelled quite a few of some of the global agreements, not directly with us, but some of our customers. And honestly, uh, our advice would be that we need to talk uh, with a lot of our clients because uh, 
I mean, the, the leasing rates will go up with this. And it's true, like Alain said, we need to make sure that it's not the full impact that goes to the clients, but it will go up. And we can see actually now that some of the car policies that is around with our customers is actually not really feasible anymore because maybe a, a car have gone up with 30 euros a month and that mm -hmm. means the car is out of the car policy. So uh, good advice is, I think I fully share the, let's say the advice of, of the colleagues here, but also the fact that we should talk about the car policies because it's gonna change a bit going forward uh, based on the microchips, let's say shortest, but also because the car manufacturers see this as an opportunity to uh, regain some of the margins they perhaps have lost in, in the last years. How is it going with the stock of used cars? Very low, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's again a, a problem. I guess it's not a problem. I guess you know in terms of the profitability. But I would say we are at the lowest level we have been in the last five years. And you have to consider that in this five years we grew a lot. So um, it's it's a double let's say impact. And of course what we are thinking about is to, as it was said here as well, we we need to have solutions for our clients, which means that some of the used cars that's coming back we will not be able to sell because it actually have to fill fulfill, a, 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 let's say, a, a need at some of our customers for a period of time. So, I mean, from our side, car sales in terms of units will potentially go down quite dramatically next year. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would like to start with a second topic. It's related to post-COVID fleet management. Um, many of us are still, uh, some of the time, working from home. Um, Alain van Joenendaal, um, that working from home principle could also be embedded in corporate strategies and corporate policies. Will this have an effect on the vision around the company car as such? Well, when I see uh, the situation here, I don't feel anymore that we are still on COVID uh, situation, right? <laughs> well, I would like to put maybe some, uh, some perspective on the discussion uh, about home working, post-COVID and everything else. Each and every year, Arval is doing a worldwide survey for about 5,000 clients, big companies, medium-sized companies, small companies, and we ask the very same question each and every year. The last survey took place from October 2020 till January 2021. So it was the middle of the lockdown, uh, the peak of COVID and so forth. But at that time, 45% of the respondents said that they want to increase the size of the fleet. Only 8% wanted to reduce it, and the rest was making it stable. So I would say that all in all, there is a clear traction from companies to do more business. That's mm -hmm. very sure. Now you talk about home working and, uh, and the impact. Uh, there are two categories, as you mentioned, uh, of cars. Probably the job cars uh, for salespeople, technicians, and so forth that will be less impacted uh, than the other one. For company cars, what we start to see in some countries is that the model is a little bit evolving. Uh, we move from company car to salary sacrifice, mm -hmm. uh, mobility budget, uh, share vehicles, and so forth. So there might be some slight impact, but not, I would say, very much. But the other thing <clears throat> is that we see more and more clients asking us to provide mobility solutions, not only for those eligible for a company car, but for all employees, through mass application, through global mobility budget, and so forth. And this, for sure, will more than compensate what we could potentially lose from company cars. Okay. Good. So I'm pretty optimistic uh, on this one. Okay. Um, Tim, uh, am I right that you expect somehow a change in the parameters of the traditional leasing contract as you are also, with your company, investing in, for example, subscription specialists and so on. There is a reason for that fleet pool uh, that you acquired. So I can imagine that somehow, somewhere, you see perhaps that contract terms, shorter term leasing, subscription could be entering our mobility area. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's very clear that 
this particular area of the mobility sector is moving very fast, and we see what, what we have seen so far, I think, in, in um, pretty much what I'm saying is that we, we see all these solutions as a complement to what we're doing. And uh, it's true that we invested into Fleetpool, which is a subscription, a digital subscription platform in Germany. And there's a real need for that. One thing, there is a, a need from actually our customers. We launched ALD Flex, uh, you know, mid-2020 and has been a huge success. Uh, and of course, with Fleetpool, we are integrating that into that and seeing a, a, a fantastic development and a strong growth in this area, both with corporates, which is where, what we are targeting right now, but clearly also on, on, on the consumer side, where our partners typically are now putting a lot of subscription models in place, you know, and the different manufacturers are looking for ways to actually provide a car. So I think there's, there's no doubt that, I mean, the flexibility, subscription, I mean, the fact that people do not necessarily have exactly the same need all over the year as they had maybe in the past is driving these, these uh, let's say, new solutions. And it's going to be an integrated part of what we will be let's say, offering to our corporate clients going forward. Mm -hmm. um, Marco, uh, does working from home and the pandemic also leverage possibilities in terms of fleet electrification? Because trips can be shorter, you can charge at home, you are more often at home. Is that something that you see? Uh, definitely, I think this is also something again or an effect that will support that development yeah? because in the past, people were used to drive five days into the office, yeah? and, and when you take a look around in Europe, also outside, so the, the policies are more and more that the employees should be in the office only between two and three days. So that means less mileage, yeah? that means maybe also less need for, for the range uh, topics that were uh, in the focus. But when I look up, uh, upstairs, also on the cars you're presenting here, I think the development is so good yeah, that this is maybe more the minor topic in the future when it's about e-mobility. Uh, but just also to echo what, what Alain and, and Tim said already, uh, I believe the policies won't change too much. Yeah? But what is to me a very clear trend is that we will see um, the rent maybe as the new leasing. So this is why uh, I said to Tim already, I also would like to be in the same position to announce uh, on a, let's say, regular base that we acquired something. But uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm not sure if this is uh, uh, known but we have uh, in 10 countries also already our rental companies. So with the Alpha Rent, so it's about 20,000 cars, all brands, not only BMW. And we focus very clearly on the B2B business. Yeah? But of course, if there's a B2C customer, also a private individual, uh, the person gets mobility. Yeah? So, and this is something we will definitely focus on in 2022 and beyond to really bring the topic forward. And then uh, since a lot of people sometimes also mix up subscription and rent in the end it's everything around utilization and when you see the the big car rental companies they are used to handle the b2c business this is definitely not our focus but when it's about also the customers and the partners here in the room or on the conference uh, i think we have to offer more flexible solutions in the future and i can only uh, agree what what tim and ald did here so well done i think a clear uh, step in the right direction okay thank you nice compliment so then we move on with um, electrification. Uh, first, I would like to start with uh, sort of a figure, an indication. Um, I'm going to start with Tim, and then we do the row. Um, Tim, uh, can you share with us how the percentage of electric vehicles, electrified vehicles you have in your fleet, or the, the percentage of electrified new deliveries that you are having at the moment? Yeah, I would say if 2021 have been amazing in terms of deliveries of electric vehicles, full electric and plug-in hybrids. I think for the first six months of uh, 2021, we delivered 26% of these cars. We have actually a target in our MOVE 2025 plan that we should get a 30% by 2025. So we are very close, which means we eventually will have to increase that target, which is good, I guess, for, for the business and, and for our customers. And we know that uh, where we are with the 26%, we have pretty much double up the penetration in the European markets. So I think as leasing companies, I think we are taking this very seriously and we are actually facilitating this transformation very nicely. Mm -hmm. Alain, and within Arval, can you share one or two figures in terms of the fleet electrification uptake at the moment? Uh, as Steve mentioned, we had set some targets for 2025 and for sure, 
will do more than that. Uh, but for the, 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 the short term, I would say we, we set a target within Arval to do twice the market in terms of BEVs, pure electrical vehicles. And if I look at the months of uh, October, the last months, uh, in the total orders, we made 31% worldwide, 31% of electrified vehicles, 10% BEVs, and 20% uh, plug-in hybrids. So, I mean, the trend is there, and I think that it's moving faster than we thought uh, uh, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. 31% is probably the highest number we have seen uh, over, the last, yeah. uh, over the last months. Good. And to, to reward and encourage the customers, we started uh, six months ago with a new uh, program that each EV will meet that we plant a tree. Mm -hmm. So uh, in each and every country. And uh, for the last month, we already planted 70,000 trees because of 70,000 uh, electrified vehicles. Good. Congratulations. Marco, uh, you just launched a new corporate identity that is also um, representing your new strategy in terms of sustainability, innovation, and so on. Can you share where you are at the moment in terms of electrification uptake? Uh, I think uh, pretty on the same level. Uh, when I take a look into our order intake for 2021, we are at 25%, so a little bit behind, but 25 and one third is uh, pure BEV. So um, uh, I, would, uh, I would wish that uh, the share of BEV would be higher, but this is also a question of availability of cars yeah, and, and adequate uh, uh, models. But uh, for that, with 25%, uh, we're super happy. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't... The, the second thing you said was the new brand, right? You know, it, it's because it fits into your new brand strategy. Yeah, yeah that was uh, exactly so. Uh, thanks uh, for, for the, for the, for, to mention it. So I think it's, it's, it's well known that we launched uh, 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 or had a brand refreshment. And uh, I think it also was time after now, now 10, 11 years uh, uh, after the merger with the ING Carlis. And what we want to do with the uh, refreshment is uh, three main topics. One thing is uh, strategic direction. Second thing is definitely also a new, new logo, mm -hmm. because the last logo was more, uh, let's say, a heritage uh, to the old alphabet and, and, and the ING Kalis. Uh, and the third thing is also uh, something like corporate identity, which is quite important. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And it uh, should also show us, uh, our employees, but also the industry and the customers, um, that we are very open also and, and highly connected to the topic sustainability, sustainability strategy. So having the right answers for, for, the, for the needs that, that are ahead of us, yeah, for the developments in our industry, and also to give a clear commitment uh, to our customers and our employees uh, that we are ready for that. And, and, and uh, thanks for the great feedback we received from several sites uh, for, for the new logo. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, we took some good decisions here. Okay. Um, because and asking you about your fleet electrification figures was just a bridge to come to something that is happening right now. It started last week. It's the COP26 in Glasgow. There, um, some bright minds need to take some decisions when it comes to tackling climate change um, or the consequences of climate change. What will your companies do to become even more sustainable than they are already today? And what can you do with your customers? Tim, to start. Well, I think we, we have already taken a commitment to drive down, uh, let's say, the CO2 emissions from our customers' fleet by 40%. And that's, of course, based on the fact that we would anticipate 30% of uh, BEVs and plug-in hybrids by 2025. So actually, what's going to happen if we increase that number, we would actually anticipate to have more than 40% by 2025. Now Stefan René will be happy, he's somewhere here. That, uh, we are setting new targets in, in public here. But uh, that's, that, that's, gonna, that's uh, gonna drive it. And I think on top of that, you probably saw that we took a state in Skipper recently. And Skipper is a multi-modality platform that uh, it will eventually will allow us to move our customers around also in a much more CO2 friendly way. So with that as well, we will actually be pushing the boundaries. And I think the, the ALD move and Skipper, let's say, combination will, will again accelerate our, our let's say, uh, capacity to drive down our CO2 emissions from our customers. 
<laughs> Alain, how do you see uh, Arval becoming even more green than you are already today? Well, um, to start with, we try ourselves to emit uh, as low as possible uh, CO2, and we reduce our own CO2 emission each and every year, and what is left, we compensate it with the special agencies so that we, come, we become Arval as a company, uh, zero emission uh, CO2, that's number one. Number two, I think that we are trying to do a lot of things uh, in the company that are recognized uh, because we got the platinum rating from Ecovadis, uh, which is very important. And I think that uh, with my colleagues, uh, all of us managed to reduce substantially the proportion of diesel cars. Uh, if we remember five years ago, 80 plus percent of the leasing companies were putting uh, uh, diesel cars on the road, and today is less than half of that. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, all of us, uh, with the target of electrification, reducing the part of diesel, uh, making sure that as a company we emit less CO2, that we contribute uh, to this objective. Plus also Arval has a special uh, practice of consulting, helping the clients uh, to improve their CO2 emission uh, targets. Marco, is there a specific action that Alphabet is going to take in 2022 to become more sustainable? I think, uh, I think everything is set. Mm -hmm. So very important is, again, the, the, the share in the new business. The second thing is that we also start now a cooperation with a uh, carbon management expert, where we also try to be really concrete that we can measure what is the CO2 uh, uh, production of a customer of us and these are also experts who help really to develop concrete measures for us and for a customer how to be to become CO2 uh, CO2 uh, neutral so these are the things so and we uh, also as i said already with the brand refreshment that we put the topic sustainability really on top so uh, and said okay um, we will consult also customers uh, about uh, what uh, are the tasks and challenges uh, uh, of the regulation uh, of CO2, what is uh, potential ways to become CO2 neutral, mm -hmm. and also what are potential measures around that. Yeah? So that is something that is uh, on top of our mind. And what I have to say, I can only say congratulations also to our customers, because when uh, now after the COVID, uh, just a little example, we had a virtual uh, reality conference, uh, because it's also about reduction. So also we start, should start with us. So also a clear agenda is now we are here all in Brussels, but also the guidance also for the sales team is really to find also new ways to communicate with customers. And we tested uh, four weeks ago a virtual reality conference. And it was amazing. We even had a customer with us and we had an intense discussion about the topic sustainability. And uh, I have to say the customers are so committed. Yeah, are really There is a lot of passion and, and intelligence behind. Uh, we also can learn sometimes from customers. Yeah? And this is something that is on our agenda for 2022 and beyond. Okay. Uh, Tim, are customers also so excited and so supportive when it comes to the digital revolution that you as a leasing and mobility provider are trying to build together with your customers? Yeah, I think <clears throat> the digitalization that is going on right now, and I will probably continue for the next two or three years, is a win-win for all parties. I mean, I think with the digitalization of all our processes, back offices, mid offices, will basically create much more friendly customer journeys and much more friendly customer, let's say, experiences. So I think that's it. And for us, it creates much more efficiency. And I think what it does as well, when you digitize businesses, you actually get access to data. And with data, you can actually start designing, let's say, products and services to a completely different degree than what we have today, so I think uh, it's a win-win whether you know you look at, uh, uh, let's say, from a customer point of view or from, from our point of view. So it's going to go, and it's, uh, I think it will going to go fast. I think on top of that, uh, the, the big challenge for us as an industry is that we are definitely not digital natives. You know, we are not uh, Ubers or uh, Googles uh, of this world, but we have to get there. And, it, you know, it's a very different business to run an e-business than to run a traditional business so I think we have one of the we have a, one of our programs which is ready to shape tomorrow which is a big program about how we're going to work in, in in the future but it one part of it is actually the let's say the digitalization of our people and upscaling our people and making sure that we attract 
also the young talent who are digital natives and who can come in and help us actually to make sure that what we develop has a value for our customers and for us, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alain, um, going from digitization to connected solutions and telematics, yes, are you satisfied with the uptake of telematics as it is today in Europe, in our industry? And how do you see that evolve? What is the ambition that you have? Well, um, I think that uh, about 81% of large companies say that they use or will use in the next two years telematics. So that's something that is totally embedded in the fleet management for large companies. In Arval, we have a team of about 30 people for 15 years working on telematics for the clients, and we see clear benefits uh, for fleet managers in terms of uh, driver safety, uh, in terms of insurance management, in terms of fuel cost, in terms of CO2 emission, and in terms of uh, CSR targeting. So yes, uh, telematics on a digital basis with all the data that are becoming accessible provides a lot of support for uh, the, the, uh, the customers. And the role of company like us is to aggregate all the data coming from OEMs, uh, telematic boxes, dongles and everything to provide a comprehensive overview for the benefit of the clients. Mm -hmm. Still, somehow, we have the impression that in some countries, and for benefit fleets, for example, there is still quite some work to do, isn't it? Well, there is, number one, some rules to comply with, uh, GDPR uh, being one of those. And when we do telematics implementation, of course, we have to make sure that all the process uh, follows the rules in terms of uh, GPR, in terms of uh, driver consent and everything like that. But the needs are different from countries to countries. In some countries, if you have a company car, you need to distinguish uh, professional usage and private usage. And therefore, telematics is a very good solution. Mm -hmm. But you need to explain, convince, and get the consent. Mm -hmm. If we go one step further, Marco, then I don't know when, perhaps you know, and then it's interesting that you can share, then we will all drive autonomous vehicles, yes? What is your idea about how autonomous is going to change, revolutionize our industry and transport as a whole? <clears throat> now, again, speaking here for, for Alphabet, um, personally, to me, autonomous driving is not the hot topic that some people might think it is. Huh? Um, and uh, that depends a little bit uh, also on the business models. So uh, in, in my past, I also had to work with Uber in the early years. Yeah? And since then, I know that, uh, that uh, more than two thirds of their uh, operational expenses are the drivers. So companies like Uber, Lyft, Didi, they're highly interested in autonomous driving because that would make their business model profitable. Yeah? So is this a topic for us at the moment in Europe? I don't see it too much. Maybe in China. And there are some studies that say that by 2030, maybe in Europe, we are able uh, uh, to have 25% of all new re registrations uh, with autonomous driving ca uh, capabilities. Mm -hmm. In the US, the prognosis is for 10% only. And for China, it's, it's 30, 35%. I think it's a PWC study. Yeah? So um, that is one thing. The other thing is also, uh, does that uh, uh, make everything better? No, I don't think so, because I think all of you know we have these five levels, or zero to five. So, and uh, maybe in China it is possible because they build the roads, the infrastructure, everything around that, and they enable cars to drive autonomous. Uh, to be honest, in Europe I don't see that. Maybe in, in special arenas or areas when it's a, it's a highway, but in a city at the moment, I don't see it as a possible. And I also do not see really the value add at the moment. Huh? So this is my personal opinion on that. Do you see value add of autonomous mobility? No, I think I'm, I agree with Marco that in, in the short term, it's definitely not, uh, it's not possible at the end of the day. I think, there are, I think it's not a question if it happens, it will happen. But the question is when. And I think it's not in the next five years, perhaps not in the next 10 years, 
but it will definitely happen. I mean, there is definitely a lot of benefit to autonomous driving cars. I mean, you can redesign the cities, the urban areas completely to a different degree. I mean, uh, you, will, you will basically see that the whole idea of ownership of a car and you know having one driver is going to completely be different. So I think that's it's another revolution that we have no idea about how to tackle at this point. And luckily, this it's going to be when I'm retired anyway, so it's good. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but overall, I think actually when you look at autonomous cars, I think what's going to happen much before is actually flying cars, because that's a much easier play. There's no trees, there's no people, there's no signs, there's nothing. You can actually take your car, and Uber is developing the flying car now, the drones. And I think that could happen actually quite quickly. Uh, so that will also have an impact on, uh, on the way we work, because some of our clients would actually like to have access to that. And uh, well, we, I guess we want to finance and, and manage anything that moves, you know, so why not? Mm-hmm. But um, yeah. It's, uh, it's very true, uh, we fully agree. But we just uh, run a test in Arval with uh, a mobile uh, shuttle, which is fully autonomous. And this uh, shuttle is driving our employees from the headquarters to the, the train station uh, as a pilot, and it's driving on the public uh, roads. So it's, it's very interesting, and we believe over time there will be a lot of benefits for the last mile, for package delivery, or for the commuters from the train station or the metro uh, up to uh, uh, the, the place where they work. And if you think about it, about 30% of the cars driving in Paris today are looking for a parking slot. This will disappear with autonomous vehicles. Huh? Just, just to say, we live in the same place. You know, we're also in Rue and Maison, you know, and we meet this bloody shuttle on the street <laughs> every day. You know. <laughs> you don't bump on it, I hope. <laughs> no, I, I have been close to driving it down, you know, because it goes five kilometers, stops constantly, you know, and and, and block the traffic, you know. So but we took we took your comments in consideration. No, it's driving 15 kilometers. So. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, final question, uh, Marco. What can we expect from Alphabet International in 2022 that will surprise the people here in the room in a positive way? Uh, I hope a lot, so uh, I think um, the people can expect a reliable partner. We are heavily working on the flexibility topic, so everything uh, you you asked before. So what can we offer? So a flexible solution, reliable partnerships, um, also the right answers if the semiconductor crisis uh, will go on. And to me, uh, I'm not too sure if the future is so bright as, uh, oui. yeah, not, not for our industry, but uh, two years ago, or last year we talked on COVID, this year we talk on semiconductor. I don't know what the situation is next year. And uh, I said to Tim already when I came in here, that was the wow, wow effect. Coming in, seeing the people, I had the feeling COVID, COVID uh, has disappeared. But on the other hand, it was also great to come together here and with the community. So thanks again also for, uh, for that, Steve. What, what you guys have organized, I think it's also important for all of us really to come together again. Yeah. Um, and yeah, with that, it is important from the question uh, that we're here to support and, and, and to find the right solutions. And last not least statement here is, uh, I think, also a lot of appreciation to, to all of us, the industry, because mm. how we managed the last two years. And it was not an easy time. Yeah? Mm. There was not a handbook. It was not written what we have to do. I think we all together as a big team, as a big, let's say, even family, I th- think we did quite well. And we will go on with that also in 2022. Thank you. Indeed, we proved to be agile also as an industry, so that's great to see. Alain, uh, for Arval, what can we expect in 2022? No uh, big news or big announcement uh, to be made in the short run. That's, uh, that's very clear. Uh, I think that uh, our number one mission, I would say, for 2022 will be to help our customers to deal with the current difficult situation. Uh, cars that are not being delivered, a price that might jack up uh, in the short run. Uh, So our number one focus will be helping our customers to go through these difficult times by finding uh, alternative solutions, uh, mid-term rentals, used cars, or whatsoever, because I think that the economy is indicating very uh, positive signals, Mm -hmm. and it would be a shame not to be able to accompany this economy. So that will be 
our primary uh, focus for next year. Okay, thank you. And Tim? Uh, no big announcement uh, next year neither from our side. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think uh, I think it most have been said. I think for our from our side, I think it's it's really important that we support our customers in the transformation to electric vehicles, and uh, that's going to be a big focus. It's going to be a big focus to actually get fleet pool off the ramp. We have uh, plans to roll them up and uh, roll them out in, in in several countries, and also with Skipper that we think is a very interesting play. Uh, we 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 would anticipate to uh, to roll those let's say, uh, services out also in a, in a few markets. And I think what, what you know, actually what we have gotten a, as, as a feedback also the last couple of days is that our dialogue with our customers, I think, have never been more intense than it is for the time being. And it's a very productive discussion we have, uh, both us getting a lot of information from our clients and our markets. And I think actually our customers expecting us to have a lot of answers on what is going on. And hopefully we are... We are answering those in, in, a, in a decent way, but I think that's going to continue in 22 as well. I mean, we are in a, in, a, in a point in time where the transformation is is going fast and faster than mm -hmm. we've ever seen. So we have to be here for our customers and uh, make sure that we have the right products and services available at the right time. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I wish you, your employees, and your customers a lot of success. Uh, in 2022. Thank you again for your presence and answering so openly the questions that we prepared. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Stephen.